Uh, thank you. Now we're going to move to the next meetup, uh, which is going to begin in a minute. And let me tell you about what's, what that is. Uh, what we're going to do is the original plan was to talk about uh, the eight psychological functions. But we have um, you know, John Roth here and we have Richard Owen here who are kind of steeped in the eight function model. So what we are going to do is that I'm going to take up all the questions that people in, you know, I've been running MBTI meetups here in New York for maybe two years, three years, something like that. So I'm going to bring up all the questions that people have ever asked about all the key questions. And I'm going to ask you guys uh, these questions um, and I'm going to have you talk, talk, you know, answer those questions from the eight function model. I know uh, John, uh, BB, uh, you need to uh, go, I right? Be, but, maybe, I will be needing to leave shortly. It's such a pleasure to be here. Yes, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you, uh, John. Would, so, Would you like, since we, since I brought up both emotion and feeling. Would you like a, a, a very quick? Please take take your time. The difference between feeling no, and emotion. No, please take your time. You can take up to five, ten minutes, whatever okay. you want. Well, I'll just uh, make. I would, a, I would love to hear that. I'll yes. just make these comments because I'm so grateful to you. Is it? Is it? Have you pronounced it? I'm very grateful to you for your question. Um, gyro or Hiro? Hiro, Hiro. Um. You know, I wrote a book on long before I got writing seriously, although I did have types in it, a, a textbook about psychiatric treatment. And I had to do a chapter on homicide, the evaluation of the homicidal patient. And so I had to do a vast amount of reading about the literature on this. And I had already learned from my trainers at, um, uh, in the Jung Institute of San Francisco, particularly Joe Wheelwright, that one of Jung's great th achievements was to distinguish feeling from emotion, and that he took some of that from William James, but he, in his type theory, he makes feeling a rational function of consciousness, of consciousness, uh, uh, not, not a, uh, uh, not an irrational function and not unconsciousness, feeling as a rational function of consciousness. Joe Wilwright used to say, that is one of the greatest contributions to the history of thought. Now, actually, there's a background in, in other people than Jung in the 18th century, including Adam Smith, who was brought up. But I was working with this and talking and writing at the same time about where emotion overcomes. And I came across the work of the neuroscientist, Carl Pribram. And in one of the many symposia that have been conducted, there have been big, big ones every so few years on feelings and emotions. I learned that you have to distinguish the word feeling from the word feelings with an S. And further, you have to learn to distinguish feelings from emotions. Feelings are sometimes called affects. But what Primrose says so wonderfully in this paper that I read that he wrote in 1968 is that feelings are monitors. When we have feelings, they're monitors. But emotions are plans. When you have an emotion, you're really, it really moves you, it comes out of you and moves you to behave. So uh, what happens is that once our emotions are starting to stir, then you get the archetypes. And the archetypes are just patterns of behavior that are strongly driven to act out. And right now we're seeing people act out the emotion of anger and in a violent way. And there are always plans burning or or destroying. There are always plans of action. Those are the plans he's talking about. Earlier than the plan comes the monitor, the felt sense that something's stirring. We always feel it when a depression is coming on or when anger is coming on or when all the others. We get stirred. Now here's where the consciousness comes in. Thanks to the feeling functions, and there are two of them, remember, 
introverted feeling and extroverted feeling, we have a chance to relate to the feelings with feeling. The comparison would be to the piano, which might be the feelings, the affects, and the, the feeling function, which is the hand that plays the piano, and also the foot that touches the pedal and modulates. When we use feeling to deal with our affects, our affects do not have to become emotions which are acted out in archetypal ways as plans which emerge out of the unconscious and then we have to pay the price later by in remorse looking back at, and then finally find the affects that led us and then finally get to the conscience that feels bad. We do that after the fact all the time. Jung psychology gives us the chance to do it before the fact if we will use and develop are two feeling functions, extroverted feeling and introverted feeling. But where are we getting still in our culture? The real support to do that. We, yes, we have emotional intelligence, but that's kind of like extroverted thinking, teaching people extroverted feeling. We've got to get hold of both feeling functions that are our birthright and get conscious of them and keep them talking to each other then we might be able to handle the affects and they won't have to become these acted out, uh, uh, very unthought archetypal uh, responses, which are not usually that helpful to anybody. End of story. Uh, John Beebe, can I ask you one quick follow-up question on that? Um, so I, I, I love this distinction between affects and the and the, the piano and the process playing the piano. Um, what would you, to, to make it clear, can you give maybe a couple of examples of FE and FI in action, which is very different from what, would, what you would consider affects? Well, first of all, uh, FE, as I, put it in just chapter one of energies and patterns is a function which starts right at the door um, by validating. Uh, I mean, you just have to say, you are having an affect right now when you look at some, an extroverted feeling is extroverted, so it deals with other people's. You are having affects and emotions for that matter. And, Yes, that's absolutely valid. That's human, that's okay. It's okay to have the affect and it's okay to be angry. Got it. I, I mean, if someone's angry about being arrested or someone's frightened about being arrested, is it too much to ask that a police person can at least validate that, that they could be angry and they could be anxious? Uh, if you start by making someone wrong, for the affect they have, you're never going to get anywhere. Then the next step is to affirm, look, this is hard for you. You're being arrested. Yes, you are frightened. And please listen to me. I am the peace officer. I will tell you how to deal with this. You don't have to. And finally, a relationship is formed. Now that's extroverted feeling. Mm -hmm. Those are the three stages of extroverted feeling. Mm -hmm. Validating, affirming, and relating. Anyone who can do that can usually handle the affects of just about anybody fine. You're, I constantly have to say to people, if you think I'm doing this, you're perfectly right to feel exactly the way you feel. I have to start there. I may have to then be able to tell them they may not have factored in that I wasn't doing that, but that's later. First, I have to do that. But what about the introverted feeling? I mean, the introverted feeling is also important. Everybody at the beginning of an introverted feeling process starts by judging. And that's one of the reasons that introverted feeling is not very popular because it, it never wants to even admit it to itself how judgmental it is in first phase. 
but it never stops where everyone is a process. Everything takes time and feeling takes time. So the second stage is that is, uh, I, I finally found the word for it, is a kind of a praising. Okay, I, okay, I know I don't like this. I can't stand this. I'm arresting this person. This person has absolutely no respect for my authority. It just makes, it just makes my blood boil. I mean, I know I don't like that. And I, have to, I have to say, well, is there the possibility that this person may feel that I'm overplaying my hand? Could I, could there be, could there be in the feeling? I have to kind of, as I say, uh, appraise it. Well, I have the power here. I have the duty and I know it. I don't have to overplay my hand. And then finally, if one can do that much, perhaps I can do what I'm, what was making me angry in the first place is establish the value. There is a value in a society for having people who make arrests and hold people accountable. But there has to be an interplay. There has to be a process where the person doesn't just come. This person, the judgment is all where it stops. This person doesn't respect my authority, and I'm going to make damn sure they do this time. And that's where the knee comes on the track. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's where the problem comes. And unless we develop, if we had emotional not just emotional intelligence, but if in the public schools, people were taught the three phases of extroverted feeling and the three phases of introverted feeling. It would be a lot better than some of that math we're taught that we never use. I don't remember a thing from solid geometry, but I wish, I wish I had had a senior year course in extroverted feeling and introverted feeling. Uh, and if they would just get the three phases of extroverted feeling and the three phases of introverted feeling. And every police officer, and as a matter of fact, every prisoner in, a, in, an, in, 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 in prison was given courses in this. Can you imagine how different our country would be if everybody took feeling seriously? Do you think emotion would, uh, do you think emotion would rule at the level it does? And, and you know, I could tell you that could, I, I, you could take that anywhere. I mean, the place I see more feeling taught than in most places, I, no one wants to believe this, but it's China, because oh. thanks to Confucius, because he had a whole lexicon of feeling, and the I Ching has a whole system of how different emotional situations are handled with differentiated feeling to come out with good judgment, the, the virtue of prudence. Mm -hmm. And, and so here, this would be a tremendous thing, but we type people could teach this and the, and the rest of the, of the world could benefit from that effort of consciousness. That's my idea. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you very much, John Beebe. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate uh, your feedback. All right, so folks, uh, we're going to continue uh, with the meetup. Uh, we're going to focus, uh, we're talking about psychological functions. Uh, today, uh, the panelists are John Roth and Richard Owen. Um, and uh, so what, what I'm going to do is that most of us here are familiar with the functions. So instead of handling it at the basic level, I'm going to actually make it very challenging. I'm going to, you know, both these gentlemen have spent a lot of time thinking about the eight function model. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to ask them general questions that have come up again and again in our MBTI meetups uh, that I've heard from many people trying to understand functions, many people trying to type themselves, um, all the main questions that have come. And I'm going to have them, uh, you know, I'm going to request them to answer them of how they use the eight function model to do that. So we're going to be talking about functions, but we're going to be talking about functions in an integrated way. So, uh, the, so firstly, uh, welcome, Richard. Hi there. I'm hi, here hi. In welcome. The background. Excellent. Uh, 
Um, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start asking questions to you. Um, I, so first, let's start with a general question. Um, I'll ask first question to Richard and then the same question to John Roth. So first question is, why do you find, you know, in what way do you find the eight function model uh, useful in thinking about it as opposed to kind of most traditional um, MBTI people who just get a four letter word and start using it with that. So what's, what's the advantage of the eight function model? Okay. Richard. I mean, I, I kind of explained stuff on this question more in depth on the talk that I did for you, like about a week or two ago, um, which is- Yes, and I, I just want to, yeah, so, I just want to say that, that that talk is up on YouTube. Many of us have, have actually seen it. We're here in people, uh, in, in person, and some of us have seen it. So you can take that for granted and we will handle the questions, but uh, please go ahead. So, so basically, you know, I see the eight functions as the kind of experiential reality of type. And from that, I take it that basically what the uh, introverted and extroverted attitudes and the basic functions themselves are actually abstracted concepts from those. Now, that's backwards to how Jung put it. And if you look at how Jung actually kind of constructed his theory, he sort of, if in the book, in Psychological Types, he's really makes a big thing out of introversion, extroversion. You know, he sees them as kind of the first big level of sort of distinction in, in terms of typology, which kind of are superordinate to the functions. You know, you've got this introversion, extroversion overarching kind of attitude and then underneath it you've got the sort of functional attitudes which are shaped by that into their variants you know the introvert introverted thinking extroverted thinking etc now it was kind of logical because of just the way that Jung came about recognizing the the qualities of these these aspects of the of mental processing in his work that he because he sort of recognized the introversion and extroversion aspects, and then he recognized the sort of the functional aspects and not just all at once, he, he actually recognized them in a certain order. So he came across, um, I think it was thinking first, and he, he kind of, he talks about how he conflated introversion and thinking and extroversion and feeling uh, with each. And so it's a basically, he thought they were like kind of connected and, and the same thing. And he talks about how that was kind of a mistake. And then he realized introversion, extroversion, in his concepts are sort of separate things in their own right. They're not just bound to thinking and feeling. But first he recognizes kind of thinking and then, and then feeling. He sort of sees them as fused with introversion and extroversion, which he kind of, kind of re repeals later. And then uh, Maria Maltzer, who was one of his correspondence uh, colleagues, um, she was actually apparently the daughter of the Bowles Empire. There's like a, a Dutch brewing company, like a distilling company that make that. There's a blue drink called Blue Bowles you can get and use it in cocktails. Anyway, she was a daughter of that empire. One of his uh, uh, colleagues and she actually basically is credited with the idea of, of the, the intuitive function. Um, and because then he's getting into the idea of the irrational functions and then he sort of got sensation as well. I think that's the order that he discovered them in. So given the way he discovered it, introversion, extroversion, then the functions, it's kind of logical that he would think then he's sort of seeing that they combine together to give you these eight function attitudes as people have then later called them. Um, now I take it that it's kind of the other way around. It's like when you see things in psychology, they're constructs, they've got qualities to them. And it's easy to be confused and get it backwards. And I think that's essentially what Jung did. You know, he actually does go on later to explain quite clearly that in practice, the functions and attitudes are always found like in combination. We never actually experience introversion or extroversion in, in some kind of like free floating form. It's always, introversion or extroversion in a functional form. Like we don't just introvert or extrovert, we extrovert, introvert or extrovert 
in a specific way on something on on a particular theme directed by a function and likewise with the functions that we never experienced the thinking function or the feeling function in actual the mental experience of daily life it only comes up as introverted thinking uh, introverted feeling or extroverted feeling so what i'm saying is the eight functions are absolutely fundamental that's what the processes are it's just unfortunate that kind of Jung made the logical conclusion because of the way he discovered the concept and that it was the other way around. That essentially there are these introversion, extroversion, and then there's the basic functions and they combine together to give you the eight function attitudes. I think it's the other way around. It's like the eight function attitudes are the fundamental thing of the, the actual processes. And you can recognize in them the quality. Well, two of them have actually got a similar kind of feeling type quality. Two of them have got a similar kind of thinking, intuitive and, and sensing quality. Um, and four of them have got an introverted quality. Four of them have got an extroverted quality. But those, those abstracted qualities never kind of arise on their own. You only get the function attitudes. You only get the eight functions. They are absolutely primary. And that's... And then it's unfortunate that Myers Briggs went down the other route. So it's, you know, actually, most people realize with Myers Briggs that they're still using the, the system to come to the conclusion of what your introverted function attitude is. So what your dominant function attitude is and what your auxiliary is. That's actually what defines the 16 types is what is the dominant of the eight function attitudes and what is the auxiliary. Um, and it do, and in MBTI talks about that. But to get there, it takes a very roundabout route of using these four pairs of, of preferences, EI, T, T, um, TF, SN, JP. And ultimately, it's using that as a kind of, literally an indicator. That's what the thing is, it's an indicator to, to try and get you to figure out what you actually want to know, which is what is the eight function attitudes which of them is your dominant and which one's your, your auxiliary? That's what you actually want to know. That's what the type actually is. So it's just unfortunate that they took the root of what Jung had talked about, you know, the separate introversion, extroversion. There's a problem to that because if, you, if you're asking somebody about, like to recognize whether they are introverted or extroverted overall, the introversion, extroversion only shows up in real life as the four introverted, function attitudes and the four extroverted function attitudes. But as you know, as we probably realized from John Beebe's like model and the eight function model, there's kind of like, even if you look at the first four of the, of the kind of stack version of the model, you know, you've got the dominant, the auxiliary, the tertiary, the inferior function. And in, that, in the eight function model, they kind of alternate in their, in their introversion or extroverted attitudes. So for me, it's introverted introverted intuition, extroverted thinking, introverted feeling, extroverted sensing. So when you're asking somebody about an overall introverted or extroversion as, um, preference, it's, 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 it's almost impossible to work out because when you really get down to it, because we've all got four extroverted and four introverted function attitudes. And one of the, you know, we're trying to get to which of the dominant, the dominant being is that is that introverted or extroverted, but there's going to be some extroverted function attitudes which you are more conscious of and more connected to than some of the introverted ones, even though your dominant is introverted. In my case, does that make sense? So, like for my stack, I'm saying like introverted intuition, extroverted thinking, introverted feeling, extroverted sensing. So if someone's asking me, do I have an introverted or extrovert preference overall? It just depends what you're talking about. Yeah, my, I, over, like my, my pr preferred function overall is introverted intuition. But I'm very comfortable with extroverted thinking. I'm also very com comfortable with introverted feeling, but not as comfortable with that as I am with extroverted thinking. So it kind of gets confusing when you actually break it down to the, to the specific function attitudes which you actually experience. To ask what my overall introversion extroversion preferences is, is really just difficult for some people because it depends which type of introversion or extroversion you're talking about as to whether that kind of that kind of has a preference above another one i hope that makes some sense that basically when it comes down to it the eight function model is is the thing you need to look at the four pairs of preferences that mbti use they get you there in a roundabout way but they're really confusing for some people 
And I think they get away from the reality of what we're actually looking at. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. So, uh, John? Yes. The, the question has to do with um, the utility or the usability of the eight function concepts. And I had mentioned that I've worked for a long time as a business management consultant. So I naturally think about these in relation to business dynamics. And my observations from doing this in a lot of different settings over a long period of time, and let me condition this comment a little bit, um, because I got um, an MBA from a top school and then I worked for 10 or 12 years uh, as a kind of an independent uh, business project consultant. So I would work six months, eight months a year in a different corporation, uh, often in different parts of the country, working on special problems. And most of these were under situations where big companies were doing mergers or acquisitions or divestitures or going through some kind of change. So, so it was a time when, when there were some open questions. And then, and then about, I, so I was doing a project with Hewlett Packard about the year 2000 and then the dot-com crash occurred. Um, and I ended up here in Los Angeles working for another large corporation. So, but these comments are based on many years of observations in a variety of different settings, business settings, particularly in business management settings. And one thing I would say is that the different types tend to congregate in different functional areas inside a large corporation. I'm sure this happens in small businesses and otherwise, depending on what you're what they're doing but the back office operational people almost invariably tend to be introverted sensation types and they will be very very meticulous they'll be very very um, comfortable with repetitive task work often they've gotten where they are because they've been doing this kind of thing in the same way for a long, long, long period of time. And the, so the, the task workers tend to move up and be managers and then they manage in the same way that they've behaved. So that's fine as long as things are consistent. But when a company has a big challenge, then something else has to happen. And getting those dynamics moving gets to be very complicated. Another place where this is evident is when you work with the technology people and you work with the software developers and the technology code writers, they're most likely to be introverted thinking people. And don't expect a code writer to automatically have the best dynamics with other people in the organization if they come up with one way that they can see how something should be done but it isn't quite what the business needs then you're it isn't going to be necessarily an easy dynamic you have to be able to finesse this when you start talking about the HR departments or the legal departments, those tend to be introverted feeling people. And they tend to have certain priorities and, and may be rather rigid about the rules and the regulations and the way things are done here and so on and so forth. And, and not uncharacteristic, the salespeople, the sales team, they will often tend to be um, more on the extroverted feeling type. And, and they're good at what they do. They're great at going out and relating to people. Um, but they, on the downside, they can sometimes make promises that 
the rest of the corporation doesn't quite know how to satisfy, but there's money, so sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. Anyway, you could you can you could go through the whole range of different functions and understand that that typically they're very good at certain things. But the problem in many big corporations is that that gets rigidified or or uh, or trapped, and so you start having these these isolated areas that have that 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 do things their own way and and don't necessarily communicate well with each other and don't necessarily play together nicely. And so what I'm advocating is that is that everyone should have an understanding of the entire big picture and how the big system works together. And there are some organizations that do that very deliberately. But, uh, but I think that, that, that in a working sense, these, you will see these often and they're very practical and they're very real. And there are real challenges to, to getting them set and operating properly. Okay, um, so let me ask the next question. We, um, I want to focus the next question on time. You know, how does kind of use of functions change over time? Uh, Jung talked a lot about uh, the first half of the life and the second half of the life. Uh, many people have talked about, um, you know, kind of development of functions, you know, uh, you know along the st stacks. So uh, any thoughts about type development across lifetime? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it is a developmental pathway. Again, that's another key aspect of how I define what type actually is. It's a developmental pathway. Um, we have essentially something, an underlying form of attention, which pulls us towards the use of certain mental processes. Um, that's essentially where I think type is really. It's there's some, there's something about type that's not a choice. It's something where there's, there's an underlying intrinsic, you could experience it as some kind of force that like literally pulls you towards your mind towards certain aspects of processing and certain ways of of looking at things um, at, at the exclusion of others and I think behind that there's a form of attention the attention is is that bottom-up mind wandering sort of uh, automatic attention it's not conscious deliberate attention um, and therefore that's where the type preference the type actually is within that system and then you've got the system of functions of processes mental processes mental systems and, and and the thing is that we all have all of the eight functions and so what makes us a type is that one of these eight functions eight function attitudes or whatever you want to call them becomes the kind of you as young would call it the orientating factor one of them becomes the kind of dominant superior it's it's like the lead process to which the others kind of have to almost play a secondary or supporting role. It's, it's the one that has the highest value. It's the one that constantly draws our attention towards this. And as it kind of unfolds, I mean, this is quite an early on stage, you know, the, the dominant function, you can see it, people say, coming out really early on in life, you know, in the, even in the first couple of years of life sometimes, certainly by the age of about six or so, you know, kids start to really become precocious but in a certain way, you know, you can see that the sort of way they want to play, the way they want to use their mind, they're naturally drawn to the kind of doing things in a certain way. I mean, even my daughter's not even two years old now. I've got my idea that she's potentially heading towards being like an introverted sensing type because she's just got an amazing concrete memory already. Like she can, you can show her a puzzle and then chuck all the pieces out and then say right where do these ones go and she knows she's she's her memory is like photographic she knows where the pieces go from just seeing the thing once she's remembered it 
it's not she's not working it out like I would from from the shape and rotating it in my mind and doing something complicated and kind of mentally fitting the shapes in before I actually do it. Um, she's just remembered where they go because if she hasn't seen it first, she can't. Um, she she doesn't know where they go. She can't work it out. <laughs> Whereas I work it out in some other kind of intuitive way. But she literally remembers what the puzzle looked like when all the pieces were in it. So then she's got this, then, then you get like later on, you get you know, people say around sort of 12 thereabouts. It, it varies, this is rough because I think it depends how well you're able to really engage with where your mind's pulling you towards and how you're able to follow that part of the developmental path to actually before you can actually then move on. I think people become like literally arrested within the development pathway if they can't follow it. Or if, you know, if their environment, you know, their parents say you shouldn't be that way, you're not meant to be like that, or so there's some really st strong force pushing, trying to conflict with that underlying pull towards that function and being that way and seeing the world in that way, then, then they might not embrace it. And that can be quite catastrophic for people um, it can really upset the balance of their mind and, and really stop it progressing to the next stages. So, you know, if it all goes well, then you know you've got a dominant function. You're something that really anchors your and, and organizes your the, this this system of functions. And then you've got an auxiliary that comes in and, and kind of is quite complementary to it because if you've got on one hand you've got a, a perceiving function as your dominant, and you get a judging function as the auxiliary, and therefore it kind of gives you a balance to to be better at having a really primary way of making decisions and, and, and taking action as well as taking in information and, and interpreting things. So you've got this sort of balance coming in automatically and this, there's this, um, you know, then the tertiary, you know, John and I would says, and I would kind of concur, you know, that's that sort of coming out maybe in one's twenties, that sort of time, you know, this, for me, it was like my th my feeling, my introverted feeling side coming out for me. Whereas before that, you know, I followed a path of being introverted, intuitive, like really kind of like off in my clouds of, of ideas and stuff. And, you know, my 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 extroverted thinking, then the development path, it started bringing in this extroverted thinking in my teens. And I started becoming really effective and efficient and like, boom, let's do this. Let's do this. Right. And it was like, right, I've got to pass this exam. How am I going to do this? This is the most efficient way to pass the exam. Do that, 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 in that order. Bang, done it, passed, done it. Now that's extroverted thinking. It's so direct and boom, you just go and do things. You act on the world. I got, I got that capacity to do that. But then I talk about this like, you know, kids like with teeth coming through, you know, a new tooth, tooth starts pushing through the gum and it's like it's coming out. It's, it's like these functions are like that. They're like parts of your consciousness pushing through the gum of your mind to come out in, in, into, into play in, in the world and you, you, you can't, often, you can't really stand against it, you know, and if you do, I think you end up in problems. And that was my introverted feeling, I, I could not deny it, it was suddenly what wasn't there before, like my really like gut felt sense of what mattered to me and what was important and what my deepest values and what, what was meaningful to me, it started to really find its way into my life. Um, you know, and then the other, we've got, you know, that's only three of the eight functions and the, the rest of it is, you know, John's model sort of suggests that we go from the third to the seventh function. We kind of we jump into the shadow before we go to the inferior function. Uh, and Jung talks about the inferior being a big part of midlife. Um, you know, my midlife probably started in my thirties and, uh, <laughs> got a sense of like I got suddenly drawn to extroverted sensing I got into swing dancing whereas currently previously I'd not be really interested in physical body sports and things like that I'd been ignoring my body in the physical world and it had been suppressed but suddenly got an interest to go do swing dancing got really into it it changed my life and I kind of went off in a new phase a new form of life a new rebirth of of, of my mind sort of in a new aspects coming through so you know and then it's not quite clear how the rest of the, the functions might pass come out and in, in this sort of these major phases of development but then on the other hand we've also got the, the, the conscious aspect of can we develop these functions enough to survive and 
do our job in the world. And, you know, this is different to that major phases of, of, um, of development that kind of happen in, in, a, in a pathway, like without us even choosing. We have the conscious ability to go at least to some degree, and it's not, you know, some of the functions are going to be hellish to do this, but to actually go and, and just improve on it deliberately and consciously. Um, you know, and if you talk about any of the eight areas of eight functioning to somebody, you know, you can pretty much realize that we have some awareness of being able to use them consciously. Like, you know, if I said, talk about any of them and said, like, can you do this? Can you do that? I think all of you would be, yeah, to some degree I can. But you probably never use it, some of the functions in as much depth or clarity or skill as someone who is their dominant and they've been drawn to that function all their life. And it's become that orientating factor, the thing that really leads the way and is, has the primary like, value for them. Um, so yeah, I've gone on a bit, but hopefully okay. I can get an idea where I'm at with it. Thanks, uh, Richard. Uh, so the next, uh, same question to uh, John, uh, John Roth. Um, how do you think functions develop over time? Well, I'll keep my comments rather brief on this one, but one, one side reference, of course, is there, there are amazing observations around this uh, in the work of John Beebe and uh, his book on energies and patterns in psychological type uh, is amazing. And I, I suggest that highly. One of the things that he's done over a long, long, long period of time is he's taken, <clears throat> created some very simple definitions of, of essences of each of the eight fundamental types. But then he's, he references them at a stage one, a stage two, and a stage three, according to development and sophistication. So the model gets extremely expanded. And what is any function um, extrovert in intuition, what it is at a level one is rather crude compared to what it becomes at a level two or a level three. So that's one way of thinking about this in a, being anchored in one particular type. But then there's this whole business about opening up one's whole scope of reference and trying to achieve some kind of accommodation or some kind of, a, of an acceptance encompassing everything. And obviously this gets to be a big deal. Now, and, and, then, there, and then there are all the complexities involved with that because, because the way an opposing type thinks and behaves can be wildly opposed to everything that you think you understand or, or know how to handle. So then you get into all of these issues of, of trust and vulnerability and acceptance and so on. So you can talk about this in a theoretical way, but I recommend having fun with this. Always have fun with this and give yourself, first of all, understand your type and give yourself permission to be your type unapologetically, number one. And then number two, make a real effort to get out and, and place yourself in places where you are uncomfortable and where you're not familiar and, and, and observe watch and and over time some of these accommodations begin to have an impact now and and because i think the the a premise of jungian psychology is that all of these type capabilities are are to some extent definable there i mean it's really a spectrum like a color spectrum rather than a, a, a discrete set of eight boxes. And so the definitions get to be a little unhelpful even at times. Um, but 
but one of the reasons why why I chose to to drill a little bit into uh, the four cardinal virtues, for example, in in our our earlier session, is that I've come to the to the personal um, the personal understanding is too strong a word, but the personal suspicion is probably more accurate that that some some notions like the cardinal virtues uh, temperance strength justice and prudence have been around for so long especially in the west but i understand that there are are comparable concepts in india and in china and so on that's a whole other big topic but that these these entities are are innate impulses which which are there to encourage us or push us into greater openness so that 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 it isn't like you have a teacher or you have a society or or a mentor even telling you that you should do something in some way but these are innate impulses that are encouraging you to develop a greater wholeness and a, and a larger understanding of your being and that's natural and that that coming to accept that there is a process of opening up and becoming more aware and becoming larger than who you are um, is natural and innate and it's a very good thing and that's what we mean by I think one another aspect of change over time. Thank you. Um, so now let's take some questions from the audience. So we have got, uh, so again, uh, we've got the following rule. Uh, you can ask your question by typing a question or typing exclamation mark or raising your hand in Zoom. Uh, number two, keep on topic. We're talking about these functions and how they operate. Number three, be brief. And number four, be courteous. Feel free to disagree with anything, but do so quickly. So it's going to be Mike, then Kia, then Adrian. Revent and show. Mike, go ahead. Uh, Mike, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, okay, I think I'm unmuted. Yes, uh, go ahead. Ask. I, uh, in uh, today's processes, the, pro the uh, process is often so complex that the uh, enterprise has a life of its own and uh, optimizing the individual functions, uh, which I see how Jung does, uh, uh, might not give you, well, well, almost definitely won't give you the right answer. And so does Jung say anything on how you handle a complex chaotic organization where uh, you, you gotta, where you, I think you need to address the uh, overall enterprise uh, rather than the individual pieces. Does that, uh, does that uh, provide a uh, basis for an answer in Jungian mode that the enterprise has a life of its own? So John or uh, Richard? Well, this is this is something. As I'd mentioned, I've worked as a business management consultant for quite a long time in a quite a variety of different settings, and and on the one hand, I think that there's a traditional sort of pattern that forces people into boxes, and and there's a lot, and and that's a very traditional way that management has been done. That it encourages very narrow specialization in a, in a singular task function, and that's considered efficiency. So you're absolutely right, is that in some organizations, this is so ingrained that these different separate areas of activity do what they do, and if there, if something rattles rattles the cage, it gets pretty chaotic. Um, so, so yes, that happens. 
but there's such a huge scope of different ranges of organizations. And there are some organizations that are much more enlightened than that and, and, and try to make an accommodation about how things work together and, and can interrelate better. And, and the whole premise about what I've been doing is that, is that it's good to be more aware of this and as, as aware of it on as large a scale as possible. Um, what you get, what you tend to get in a lot of organizations is they tend to um, become rigid or atrophied over time that even people forget why they're doing things the way they're doing it. They're just doing it because this is the way we've always done it. And then all of a sudden, if there's a pressure to change something, then not only is it difficult to change because we don't like to change, but it's difficult to change because we don't know why we're doing what we're doing to begin with. So, so you know, the best one can do is find oneself into a situation where people are more, are more uh, understanding and more enlightened in how they, they approach this. Okay. Next question is from Kia. Kia, go ahead. Uh, Kia, you need to unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, Adrian. Adrian, go ahead. Yeah, I have a follow-up question for Richard Owen on uh, introversion and extroversion not existing in isolation, but always being paired with a function. Um, there's a popular biological model by Hans Eysenck where introversion and extroversion are related to cortical arousal. And so uh, the theory is that introverts have naturally high cortical arousal levels and extroverts lower. And so the idea is that extroverts need stimulation from the environment while extroverts need less. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on the research showing that there may be an overall introverted or extroverted attitude. So, okay, so, yes, I mean, the biological stuff, obviously, there are, like, things to do with the reward system, for instance, for extroversion. We know that that's, like, linked to it. So, you know, extroverts get that reward buzz, like, out of getting something or whatever, or doing something, and it kind of, that feeds, and, you know, there's this, this sort of dopamine system and all that. Yeah, so, I mean, that that's a thing, but you know, the, what, how the psychological level works with the biological level isn't entirely clear. So, you know, with this uh, sort of model, we're talking about a sort of experiential model that's not, it's not grounded in biology. It's grounded in experience of, of what is arising in the first person. Um, what I can say is though, like, if you look at, say, the big five, um, uh, you look at the, so if you get into the trait model of the big five and you look at the uh, facets, so with any of, the, any of these domains of personality, you have facets underlying it. And the facets are all quite different ways. So if in, the, in that sense of the trait sense, extroversion is about like the energy that you put out there into the world, into various things. And you've got facets which break down quite distinctly different areas of things you could be putting energy into out in the world um, and you know you find most people when they get down to the facet level of personality those facets they're not all always complete always the same level they're all they're like they tend to be you know you put into a jagged profile so like if you look at them mapped out you know you'll see some of them are high some of them are low so you know that even in that sense you don't get like you don't tend to get everything extroverted so the analogy for that in the type model is that yes certain of the function attitudes are going to be dominant more dominant in your in your minds than the other ones and some of them are going to be less dominant so even on the even on a trait level sort of level then you know you find that like when you actually get down to well what is it you're introverting or extroverting then it's usually quite clear that that you vary in in, in exactly the different things that you could be extroverting about, for instance. Um, introversion isn't measured in trait, in trait measures generally. It's, it's kind of, it's like a, it's, it's a deficit of extroversion. But I hope that sort of answers part of that. Um, what you've asked, what, anyway, the question that you asked. Okay, uh, next question is from Revent. Revent, go ahead. 
In, in the last talk, uh, you emphasized about how some of the functions are energized by the animus or anima, and I think uh, they were the fourth and the fifth, fifth functions, if I'm not mistaken. So I was just wondering about how anima slash animus possession looks like for people with the different functions over there and how, how can each type uh, hand, handle it differently according to their, uh, their own specific needs. Well, I can say a little bit on this and, and Richard may have more to say uh, because his practice area is quite different than what I've focused. But if one looks at, at Jung's initial model or John Beebe's model, um, awareness of anima and animus dynamics develops in a certain way at a certain time. Now that's awareness, but still anima, animus dynamics can complicate things or enrich things anywhere. Um, so, so, so you can have an animus complex or an animus pro problem without even knowing you have it, but it's there. All you know is you're having a huge conflict with somebody. Now, John Beebe, of course, is, has spoken about this brilliantly. And if you've seen his story, and, and you can find that about, about his Chinese laundress and how he came to understand what, what this dream figure was and what this reality figure was and what they meant to him. And he defined that as, as anima animus in type terms. But so, so, so that's one way of looking at it. But the other thing that I might mention in relation to all of this is that, is that a lot of these concepts are so, are, 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 are require a kind of a poetic sensibility and artistic sensibility because they are so fluid and they, they, they're there, they're present, but they can show themselves in many, many, many different ways. And, 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 and it, it's, it's, it is so personal that what happens to you is going to be yours alone. And you're the only one who's really going to have a grasp of understanding it. But yet the dynamic, the, the energy, the power is, is going to be tending in that way under certain circumstances. But so, 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 there, so there are just two quick observations about this. And one of course is just repeating the notion that, that if you have a primary function attitude defined this way, that your anima animus aspect is most likely to show itself in an opposite attitude, opposite function. I won't define that. We've talked about that. That's, that's one point to reemphasize. But the other point of it, that all of this has to do with gender dynamics as well. And, and one thing to keep in mind is that is that these are also, from a, I'm gonna say a, psych, a psychological point of view, these, these are also very fluid and, and specific physiological gender characteristics are not necessarily locked in with um, opposing function dynamics or archetypal, um, ways of showing themselves and being. Um, so, so I'm not sure that's helpful, but those are a couple of ways that, that, that I find necessary to consider. Um, I can look a little bit on this sort of anima animus possession thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a quite a troubling experience when it happens, you know, usually in, in this extreme stress. And we learn an awful lot about ourselves from these experiences and these reactions. Um, you know, it's usually when, when we're at our worst and, and often like, you know, highly charged emotions. Because you know, with type, we're talking about kind of polarity within the system, you know, on the, to the degree that something becomes more conscious, something else becomes less conscious, more unconscious to, as, as a balance. and, and 
but as it gets kept down and repressed and then pushed down and and out of consciousness the, these this slightly inferior function that the anima animus is tied to with, with john Beebe's model you know it, it can build up a lot of uh, energy as a compensation that it really wants to come out in a big way when it does it's like being held out and held back so long so you've got this you know extreme stress and what does it look like for different people i mean i, I often use the terms um like introverts ex explode in <laughs> uh, extroverts implode so that's kind of one way i look at it it's like you know, me as an intro introvert like my dominant function is introverted so when my inferior extroverted sensation explodes out in in um you know usually i'm quite quiet and contained on, and focused on my inner experience and my inner world people know about it when i explode like when i go off it and like like something triggers me and it could be stuff in the physical world like like earlier today i had it i was cooking the sunday dinner and it was i was trying to pour the oil from the dish a really difficult sensing task like pouring oil hot oil from a dish into a jar to keep it and and it dribbled out around the thing and it fell onto the counter and it was dripping down into the cooker and i was like no, and I, I, you know, I, I, scree I shout it out. You know, I've been. If you measured my volume level on a kind of like decibel meter, you know, over the last hour, it'd be pretty much a low level flat line, and then bang, that moment when I spilt the oil, you know, that was me getting the grip. Suddenly, it just hit me, and like I just yelled out. It's pretty like severe. People get shocked, but the opposite is like someone who's got an in, uh, extroverted dominant function in the grip um they can just go AWOL they can disappear you're used to them engaging with the world a lot of the time they might be engaging with you a lot and suddenly like you've got to watch out for it because you can you don't even know it's happening sometimes they they just go whoa. they just go they just get sucked in into this horrific internal experience what it is depending on their, their inferior function and they can't escape from it and they're sucked and they're trapped inside in this in this the world closes in and they disappear from you like in, in a social sense sometimes because like you know you've got to watch out for the people here in, in your life who are extroverts and, and if they get into a chronic state of stress and they get gripped in this um inferior grip of, of the animal animus you've got to really watch out because they can be in, in a horrific state and you might not know about it you know suddenly like you, you're not they're not responding to your messages and things and they're just they're not there anymore when they're normally there and it's like it's a very different experience and um marie louise von france in her lectures on typology she talks about the eight um functions as, as inferior as well it's another resource to look at there's lots of people um naomi quank's book uh, was that really me that's a great resource for that stuff as well learning about what the experiences are like for the different types uh with their inferior okay uh so next it's questions from joe deborah aiden nari madeline and Vinny. joe go ahead hi thank you both for um your comments today and hosting today's meetup thank you everyone um the idea of uh, Richard, you had actually mentioned the that parents sometimes, or even it can be applied to organizations as a whole, believe that people should behave a certain way, and this ultimately has some disastrous consequences uh, to an individual's personality. Um, linking that to, to John's comments, if you're undergoing a large-scale organizational change, I know that Jung wasn't necessarily, uh, he didn't feel that dogma um, really was sufficient for modern psychology, but wouldn't the ideas of handling that type of ongoing change uh, incorporate the ideas of courage, temperance, wisdom? Uh, it would be the most uh, humane way of undergoing an organizational change uh, to a person that may have been uh, damaged by the organization in the first place. Uh, John, go ahead. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I don't think that that's a, a question that Jung talked about explicitly. Uh, now, because in context of 
who Jung was and what he was trying to do. He was a European, he was Swiss, he was a young man, there was World War I, there was the Worldwide Depression, there was World War II, and so a lot of his thinking was on a very large scale with very large topics about, my gosh, how did all of these things happen? How did they come about? What, what is necessary that things can become, that become better from a very high level? And of course, he dug deeply into his own dreams and, and he kept his own journals and explored with that. And, and he, he got interested in, in very obscure topics, presumably like alchemy and, and, uh, and Asian philosophy. And, and so, so I think the benefit of Jung was really as deliberate as he could be. He raised questions and, and it, attempted to bring forward a kind of a recognition for a meaning or a legitimacy in certain topics that were not common or were neglected, but somehow, from his point of view, seemed to be, have something great to offer. That's Jung. And then you get into the question of, well, okay, you know, here we are today and, and we work in certain ways in certain places and we live our lives and, and we have our common experience and I'm part of this organization or that organization or that church or this community or this business or this family. And, and, and I, I'm going to say that, 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 of course, Jung didn't say specifically what a person should do in those settings. Um, but again, uh, I don't, I'm not sure that you attended the, our first early session, but that topic is something that I dwelt on quite a bit in the first session. Um, so either you and I could have some communication around this, or, or um, I think Shrikant has recorded that earlier session, so I might invite you to take a look at that as well. Thank you. Uh, okay, next up is uh, Deborah. Go ahead. Okay, is my audio working? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, you guys might know that I'm a classroom teacher. I teach fifth grade next year. I'll be teaching fourth grade. So I was interested in the application of this to my classroom teaching. For example, um, there are so many variables. It's incredible um, to please everyone and my goal is to bring out their natural curiosity and to give them lots of choices as to how to produce work and even do the work. Um, so I'm just wondering your thoughts on this um, situation, how to use this in my classroom teaching. I guess it depends you know, how much freedom you've got in your curriculum and your education system um, and what age the kids are at um, but you know an ideal world there would be something for every dominant type to to be able to excel at and and, and make the most of their the way that their mind is trying to develop um, you know whilst there could be support for the things that they're not so naturally developed at and, the, and you know and, and a lack of shaming for the things that they fail at you know that would you know they're all very key it's, it, on, in reality you know I certainly know in the UK we've got certain it's always political as to what um, the education system is focusing on and you know it's sometimes going more towards uh, certain types of certain subjects and away from you know at the minute it's going again away from like music and creative subjects and things like that so you know, it's all going to depend on your kind of, um, you know, maybe it's the way that, it's more about the way that people approach it, I think, rather than what, what they're doing. I think, like, it's the same in the, in the workplace. You know, if people have got the, 
if you just say, right, this is what we want to achieve, but I'm not bothered about how you go about it, that's usually a bit better for people because then they can approach it in a way that suits them. Um, so offering the freedom of how people do a task, I think will be the key to it rather than necessarily what you do, because then if and if what you do in the lessons is, is kind of restricted by a curriculum, then at least if you can offer them freedom of, of how they approach it, you'll find they'll start to do it in, in natural ways that give them the freedom to, to, to follow their own preferences, I think. Thank you. Yeah, one thing I'd suggest is, uh, again, um, we did an earlier session and one of the topics that I covered was a, uh, a new way of encouraging creativity called design thinking. And, and what I showed, what I tried to explain um, in my conversation about design thinking was how design thinking encourages creativity, but how to do design thinking, you really have to touch explicitly on all of the eight function areas. And when you have a small group of people, there will be someone who's very good at one thing, but not necessarily very good at other things. So, so as a group, you learn to give room to the person who knows that particular aspect of things. And then, but also no one to no one to talk and you know and no one to to be quiet and let somebody else take a lead so and and even though design thinking started out as a university thing and a big corporate thing maybe that there are people who have taken design thinking and they're teaching it in elementary school i don't work with this but if you look at um if you go on the internet and you look at ideo ideo and you look at IDO and grade school training, um, I think you'll find that some people have taken this and they're doing some really amazing things with this. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, next up is Aiden. And then, so it's gonna be Aiden, Nari, Madeline, and Vinny. Aiden, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is twofold uh, for, for this class. I guess just as a, as a qu quick question, I'll, I'll I'll ask them both um, quickly. The first question is, in terms of the organizational application of, of type, how does it relate to confidentiality in terms of in a group setting? I know recently being trained, that's um, a topic in terms of who's privy to that information in terms of how it's used so that it feels uh, safe and that the answers are given uh, correctly, as opposed to how someone thinks they're supposed to take the test. So that's 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 one question. The follow-up question, um, you know, gosh, I don't want to. You can interrupt me, uh, um, Aiden. Go ahead. Go, yeah, you can interrupt Aiden, me. Go ahead. I, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and finish your second question. Okay, because you know, there's a little bit of backstory, but you know, I, I don't know who's in this group, but I know that in terms of. Um, Myers Briggs specifically, and then you know, getting into the the eight function model of of the um, psyche, it all originates from Carl Jung, who's uh, you know the uh, was operating a, a contemporary with with Freud and and Adler. Uh, a Aiden, uh, you can take all of that for granted. We we did a whole lecture on this, so just assume that everybody knows everything about functions. Go ahead. Okay, cool. So the way that it came out of for Jung was just a functional way to understand temperamental differences in terms of how people are uh, are, are using the material in, in front of them. But the point being, you know, I think his interest as he was talking about it was using using function superficially to understand each other, like a husband and a wife, for example. Um, and then more deeply on a personal level in terms of how we integrate the functions and develop the functions in ourselves including, I guess, in this context, the eight uh, uh, expressions of the four functions. So I'm wondering, just in terms of real practical self-application, I heard some earlier about like, you know, the eight, the, the eight um, function uh, in terms of type development theory, but I, I would love to hear some more real concrete examples of type development for an individual in terms of someone who's on an individuation path, who is interested in being whole. In other words, they're not interested in performance, 
They're not interested in performance in themselves or organizationally. They're interested in their own evolution as an individual. How can we use type, which I think is created for this purpose, to go more deeper? To go oh, deeper. Thanks, Satan. I, can I, I just kind of go out before I forget what it was, the first question that was about. Uh, it's about confidentiality, but you can, you can skip that one. The second one is far more interesting. I had a point on that though because it was it was on my head. I was holding it in my head. Um, it's it's about yeah type and, and confidentiality. So the situation you're talking about, like in a workplace, and like what are the consequences? You know, if, you, if you're a practitioner, you know you've got to have a sense of of not going out and sharing. It can be complicated. Like you know, if you've got a sis, like a stakeholder who's like paying you, and then you've got to be clear that like you know you can't share the results of something unless the client is actually wanting to share it. Um, but it's obviously a difficult situation when, when the client's paying for it. So the thing is though, you shouldn't type is not supposed to ever be used for selection and recruitment because of the fact that type is about underlying preference. It's not about your actual expressed behavior and what your skills and abilities are. So, you know, there shouldn't be a consequence of, of like, you know, ever having to, to, to gain or lose work or, or anything because of being a certain type, you know, that should never happen ever in the workplace. It's just not ethical to do that. Um, so, you know, even if, even if other people did know what your type is, you know, hopefully they would use that in a way to communicate with you better and understand you. you know, it, it should never be used in a sense of actually selecting people for something and excluding people on the basis of type, because that would not be right. So, um, I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Yeah, to go to the second point, um, the second part of the question, and, and Richard covered the first part, I'd, I'd have comments on that because I've seen it in real practice. But um, to go to the second part of the question, I'd say the helpful thing is to, uh, with regards to type definitions, what's always stated at the end of the day is that is that that it's a way of you helping you understand yourself better and the labels are kind of secondary to the degree to which it helps you work in the world but being said that let me give you a personal example and, and i'd kind of say have fun with it so I'm, if you've listened to me talk this morning or otherwise, you probably figured out that this is a deeply conceptual intellectual guy. And he probably spends, he reads a lot of books and he probably spends a lot of time in his headspace. And that's fair. But I'm in Los Angeles and I'm here in Hollywood and I'm here in Beverly Hills. And believe you, not everybody here in the streets is a deeply intellectual person who reads a lot of books just the opposite and so so how how the heck am i supposed to get around with people and have friends and get along in the world where where this is the environment where i found myself so so yeah i do my work my day work uh, and that's dull and boring, but then, but then evening comes and I can get out in the space. So one of my practices is I get out of my head by, by stopping at some of my local clubs in the evening and decompressing before I go on home. But there's a place in my neighborhood that is a little sports bar and, and it's owned by some names you would probably know from the entertainment industry. And all the people in there are actors and actresses and musicians and writers and agents. They're all extroverted sensation people. And they do karaoke a couple nights a week. And it's amazing because you get film quality professional musicians who are just walking up on stage and doing karaoke. Now, I'm not gonna do karaoke that's the last thing you would want is to be there when, when, when I try to sing something, but I do karaoke. So what I did was 
I, and this is a long story, but I'll, it's, I think it's a little bit fun. I'll cut it short. I had a dream a couple of years ago and, and, and over and over and over again in my head, three o'clock in the morning, the phrase, hard rain is going to fall, hard rain is going to fall, hard rain is going to fall, was drilling over and over and over again in my head, three o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> I woke up and, and realized this and thought, what the heck is this? I have absolutely no idea why this is in my head, so demanding in my head. Then I, then, so I, then, then I went back to sleep. Morning came, alarm clock. I went through my routine. I started driving to work, listening to the radio. And that was the morning they announced that Bob Dylan was winning the Nobel Prize for Literature. Now, there's absolutely no way that I would have had any idea that this was going to happen. But here's something very important and, a, and a, that gets a lot of attention about, about specifically about Bob Dylan and so on. So what I feel at this point is that I was having a, a dream that was actually giving me an impression of something that was that may have been precognitive when I would have no way of knowing this. Well, so then what I did was if you follow the story about about Bob Dylan and Hard Rain and how he didn't contact the committee and accept the award. And, and Patti Smith went to sing at the Nobel ceremony and the song she chose to sing was Hard Rain, but she forgot the words. I mean, you go down the rabbit hole with these things and they turn into remarkable explosions of, of, of curiosity. Um, so what I did was I went to my karaoke club and instead of singing Hard Rain, I let them play the music in the background and then I created a six minutes talk story about how to appreciate your inner consciousness, how to listen to your dreams, how to, how to follow the curiosities in your, in your, in your inquiries and in your, in your, your uh, adventures wherever they take you. And, and, and I had a lot of fun with that. And, and even though this was not the typical thing, I'm, I'm performing with my authenticity and my personality in an audience which would normally be very alien to me. But, and yes, it's uncomfortable, it's terrifying, but you do that, you make yourself do this, and then you can come to a point where, where and, and I did that and I got, and yeah, some people totally didn't get it, but, but I also had people come up to me and say, that was amazing, that was fun, I'm so glad you did that. So, so anyway, that's, that's just a little personal story and thank you for indulging me and in, in carrying on with that. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, next up is Nari. Nari, go ahead. Hi, thanks so much for um, this really enlightening presentation. I really enjoyed all of it. Um, so in June, I'm doing a little lunch and learn at my office place um, about like, MBTI types and how they can be applied at the workplace. So like this is very apropos to that. I'm taking lots of notes. Um, but I, one thing that I've noticed is like beginners that are getting into like learning about the eight functions. Um, there's a reliance on stereotypes. A lot of people are like, oh, you know, she's good at sports. She must be SE dom or like all SE doms are good at sports sort of thing, which isn't always the case. So I wanted to know what recommendations do you guys have in applying what you're learning without being like stereotypical and fitting people into boxes? Um, say something on that. Um, yeah, so John Beebe's model is really helpful for them saying, okay, on the outside, I can see that they're, they seem to be engaging with the physical world of you know and their embodied world and, and, and the physical senses so you could say okay so they seem to be engaging extroverted sensing quite a lot or you know they're good at sports because you know they may have been continually engaging that since they were a little child you know all, all the way through to get good at sports you have to spend a long long process so you know you see somebody at the, at, at the point when they're already good, you know there's a big story behind that and they spend a lot of time in, the, in their sport. So you can sort of say, okay, but then what quality is it when they're, when they're engaging, when they're in that state, engaging with their extroverted sensing, 
what quality does it have? Like what kind of character does it have? So for instance, you can then start to tell the difference between say the heroic um, dominant function SE and say the, the tertiary, like the child SE. You know, this is a thing about the, the SE, like when it's an eternal child function, like they tend to get like quite excited and like, oh, like over kind of enthusiastic about stuff and get into extreme sports and, and crazy stuff and go, yeah, let's get, let's like a kid on a, on a roller coaster or something. Going for this, you know, I had a, a friend who's a tertiary SE and, and they, you know, they went off in, in, in their twenties and got into like roller derby where, where, where women dress up on roller skates and start smashing each other out of the way and got into kite surfing and, you know, there's a guy like, you know, and he got into like free rock climbing, like things like that, you know, are they kind of going on at it in like a bit of an over, over the top sort of sweet shop kind of way with, 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 with or are they trying to you know, maybe showing a different kind of quality to it? So you can start to pick up, pick out on how it's, how it's expressed by the archetypal side in the eight function model. But how do we not, you know, the thing is ultimately tight is about experience. Like we should never be really sitting there looking at people because they're, ex and, and trying to work out the type because the, only they know what their underlying preference is. Because as I explained in my talk two weeks ago, it's like the expressed like third person view of that, of their, of their behavior is, is a mixture of like what their underlying preference is pulling them towards, plus where they are in their development journey, plus what, um, what they're consciously trying to express, what they're deliberately focusing on, what their environment has, has forced them to focus on. So it's like you're trying to, to get to the type thing, you're trying to unpick all of that and get to something which is an underlying draw, an underlying pull towards something, which is underlying, therefore it's inter internal for them. So only they know. So you've got, you can say to them, well, like, hey, well, you're really good at sports. 